My name is Rosanna Flema Caldera. I am the founder and executive director of Equal Ground, an LGBT advocacy organization based in Sri Lanka. Also the co-founder and current chair of the Commonwealth Equality Network and a former co-secretary general of ILGA. I'm joined by Dr. Menaka Guraswamy, who is a senior advo advocate at the Supreme Court of India. Um, Dr. Guraswamy has successfully sought legal reform in India and was instrumental in bringing the Section 377 case to the Supreme Court that saw the decriminalization of homosexuality in India. Uh, she has also advised the UN Development Fund and UNICEF on human rights law and was featured in Time magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2019. She continues to be an advocate for equal rights for all Indians and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with her about her work. Menaka joins me now. Welcome, Menaka, and it's lovely to see you again. It's been a while. Um, so we don't have very much time, uh, and I know how precious your time is as well. So let's get straight to the questions. We'll start by saying congratulations and thank you for your role in securing the decriminalization of homosexuality in India. Could you tell us some of your experiences from that litigation, and in particular, how was the case won? Yeah. Well, firstly, it's so lovely to see you, Rizan. It's It's been a while, um, uh, and especially in these very difficult times, um, it's wonderful to see uh, a friend um, and a comrade, um, even if it's on a screen. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, you know, how is it won? Well, firstly, I think, you know, um, <clears throat> the case was heard by the Supreme Court in uh, 2018. Uh, in terms of final arguments, um, this petition that that we that we had filed was filed um, much earlier in 2016. We had a couple of procedural hearings. Um, as you know, the fight against uh, what was Section 377 as it impacted um, LGBTQ people uh, has been a long battle, many decades in the making. Uh, mm -hmm. Battles that we initially lost uh, and then subsequently won. I think that what has been different um, from our earlier efforts um, in uh, litigating <clears throat> the constitutional challenge to the section uh, was that in 2016, when we filed uh, the petition, we actually filed what we call in the law writ petitions. Uh, that means that we actually had LGBTQ people who went to court. So we didn't use public interest litigation. We didn't have organizations that stood in for LGBTQ people, sorry, I must, um, but we actually had gay people uh, in court. So we had gay men, lesbian women, um, and in subsequent petitions, uh, we had many, many um, queer people, transgender people who came to court. Um, I think that was the big uh, change. That was the big move um, that has recast uh, not just queer rights litigation in India, but how queer people use the courts in India. I think uh, what changed um, was really uh, those first five people who agreed to go to court for us. Uh, that was the big moment. Uh, and they were very brave because, as you know, Rosanne, we lost the, uh, the original challenge in 2013 when the uh, Supreme Court upheld Section 377 and its constitutionality. So in 2014 and 15, when my colleagues and I uh, were trying to put a new case together, it was very difficult because this was being done in the shadow of not just an old sodomy law, but a sodomy law that had recently been upheld. Um, and so we had these five wonderful Indians who decided to go back to court. What has been fascinating, right, is of course, you know, as lawyers writing up that petition um, and, um, you know, was drafted by a wonderful team of lawyers. Um, um, and the way they wrote that petition um, was that they captured the stories of these five people, how Section 377 hurt them, hurt their lives, uh, the consequences of that, the stigma, the shame. Mm -hmm. But also, um, it actually talked about their life. It talked about Navte Jogger, the lead petitioner, being uh, in a relationship with Sunil Mehra, petitioner number two, for 26 years. Uh, wow. It talked mm. about um, uh, Amanath, um, you know, petitioner number four, 
being with his partner, Francis, for 34 years. And his partner died a few months before we filed. Um, and these were choices that we made. Uh, we made these choices because we wanted a set of people who, uh, whose lives, life stories could be, you know, could actually be presented to the court. As lawyers, we are storytellers. You must have powerful stories to tell. And I think a key point in, in the case was, was telling these stories of, of this couple who'd been together 26 years and this couple who'd been together 34 years. These were men and women who were broadly the age of these judges that we were appearing before. Um, these were lives that could be related to. So I think that's the first thing, what we call humanizing, humanizing queer people, which is what LGBTQ petitioners do when you take them to court. They enable you to humanize uh, a community. Right? I think that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is the way the story was told in terms of the law. It was it was a story that we told in terms of the rights that were being denied to us, uh, the consequences of the denial of those rights. Uh, but also we framed it as the right of every Indian, um, you know, to have a choice of partner. Uh, we did not frame it as a case of gay sex you know, whatever that is. We framed it as a right to a partner. And in doing that, we put ourselves um, in a constitutional arc uh, where the courts have protected inter-caste couples, um, inter-religious couples, so inter-faith couples, opposite sex. Uh, and we said that we were also Indians uh, who were asking for that same constitutional protection of a right to a choice of your partner. Um, and that's how the petition was written. Uh, that's how it was framed. Um, um, and I think um, that, that that was very key because you located yourself in domestic constitutional jurisprudence um, and you located yourself in those struggles that were being waged in the courts in the context of interfaith and intercaste couples. So I think that was the second thing. And we, we chose very, uh, you know, at one level today, uh, you know, we're in 2021. Uh, it's a couple of years since the sodomy law was struck down and you wouldn't recognize the court system uh, in terms of how it receives gay people. Today, high court after high court, we won at the Supreme Court, which is the top court, but high court after high court in various states protect gay couples, protect lesbian couples uh, when their families harass them. Uh, so it's one of the most remark. it's a sea change. So where gay couples, lesbian couples, transgender couples are, were afraid of the law. I'm sure much of that fear still remains, but nonetheless, many are going to court saying, protect my rights. And this is not just happening in cosmopolitan cities like Delhi or Bombay. This is happening all over the country. Uh, and we collect these cases uh, because we're building the case for marriage. So we collect these cases and it is remarkable. Last week, uh, the High Court of, of, of Madras, the Madras High Court, the, a judge protecting a young lesbian couple, uh, he actually said that, you know, um, he advised the family, the parents to go for counseling. He himself said, I need to understand more. But the one thing I'm sure about is the certainty that these two young people have to be together. It is that, that, that certainty in that love, which is actually meant that I have had to relook my assumptions and I urge the parents to relook their assumptions. It is unimaginable, you know, that five years ago we would have had this kind of reception. That's so, great. You know, yeah. I mean, sorry, Rosa, I didn't mean to, but I, no. I think that I, I'll end with this, that, you know, there are many kinds of closets, right? There is a closet that individually queer people have, but there is also a constitutional closet. When gay people don't go to court for themselves, when queer people don't go in their own names, you are putting your community in a constitutional closet. Very true. There are great perils to using institutions and larger groups to litigate your stories because you are continuing to put yourself in a constitutional closet. Judges need to meet gay people in their room, in their courtroom. And that is what we did. We, we took them into the courtroom. Absolutely. And what a battle it was, too. Uh, but, you know, having just finished that not so long ago, <laughs> I mean, just what, three years ago, yes. Yes. Uh, you are now uh, currently litigating the case for marriage equality in India. Sure. Are you sure. optimistic about further reform? Uh, what role will the courts play in securing LGBT rights for Indians in the future? Yeah. And, you know, you guys are 
the granddaddy, you know, uh, in our region. So we are all looking at you uh, to make, uh, you know, the path open for, for all of us as well. Sure. So, yes, tell us about that. You know, I think that um, uh, it's, it's a couple of different things, right? One, I think since 2018, it has been remarkable to see, um, you know, how courts, high courts, you know, have stepped up. Um, for queer citizens. Uh, we've had employment protection, we've had partnership protection, um, the police are now protecting gay people. It's really quite um, fascinating. And I know that there is still a lot of stigma and there are lots of issues that even full equal rights won't address. You know, that is a process of change um, that keeps occurring despite the law changing. Right, so I think in these last couple of years, we've witnessed that change. Um, in terms of marriage equality, look, I think the reality is, is uh, you know, my partner and I um, um, try to buy medical insurance, right? We've been together almost 10 years. She's a lawyer, Arnurthi Kaju. Um, I litigate these cases with her and a larger uh, set of friends and colleagues at the bar who I absolutely adore. Um, and so, you know, it's the small things, right? Uh, we were, uh, you know... Uh, the insurance, the medical insurance guy, you know, you have to buy medical insurance. Uh, had, had, I'd left a check for him. Um, and um, she happened to be in the office that day. And, and he came to pick up the check and I had left for a meeting. And he said, oh, this amount is missing because she's not added the tax to the check. Uh, so she said, okay, that's not a problem. I'll just write you the balance. Um, and he said to her, no, no, you can't do that because only blood relatives can pay. Oh my gosh. Uh, for medical insurance. Uh, only blood relatives can buy insurance for each other or collectively. Um, we looked at this and we said, well, what is this blood relative? And a blood relative is either a parent child, a sibling or a spouse. So we wrote to the insurance company and we said, well, you know, we did this and we tried to buy insurance. And they said, no, no, you have to be married to buy insurance, to buy medical insurance. This is, you know, not, not rocket science. Um, and these were just our everyday experiences, right? Um, uh, these were our like everyday experiences, and we would keep hearing from same-sex couples. Um, doctor in Bombay who had to go in to the hospital on a daily basis to see his patients. He has a same-sex partner. COVID is rampant. Uh, and he's terrified and the law will not let him make any provision for a same-sex partner. No benefits, no pension, nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, couples after couples. Um, you know, I think the reality is that ideally, yes, we would love to litigate this piecemeal, employment discrimination, medical insurance, um, all kinds of, you know, step-by-step -step pieces of litigation. Uh, and I think there would be over 800 areas of law that you would have to change. Wow. The reality is, is the common law, and we're all based on the common law, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's anyone in the region and otherwise. The reality is the common law is premised uh, on rights that flow across blood relationships. Uh, families are defined as either opposite sex spouses, so marriage is a premise. Uh, for a blood relationship or uh, siblings or parent-child. This is the premise of the law. Irrespective of what you want to do, whether you want to alienate property, whether you want to inherit property, whether you want to protect your um, same-sex partner, the law will expect you to be in a blood relationship for those rights to flow. Um, and so clearly, um, you know, we needed to make this journey towards a full constitutional citizenship because, uh, you know, history will tell us, Roseanne, that, you know, uh, we have not allowed interracial marriage because we had a opinion as a society that on racial purity, mm -hmm. on dominant races and subordinate races. We did not allow interfaith marriages, interreligious marriages in India till, till independence, until there was reform in the law. Uh, because, again, we had these notions of purity and, and subordinate and dominant faiths. Uh, we did not allow inter-caste marriage till uh, there was law reform in personal law and Hindu law, again, because we had these notions of purity. So we have always 
uh, as societies, as common law societies, as societies pre-common law, kept you know people apart, premised on these notions of purity, dominance, and subordination. Uh, in India, where we commit to the constitution, my, all my life as a lawyer has been about litigating constitutional rights. Uh, it is very clear to me that if you want full equality as LGBTQ people, then you must have access to all rights. You may choose to exercise them or not. You may choose to get married or not. That's a different story. But the law must offer you that option. Um, and where you have communities that are left out of marriage, it is it reinforces discrimination. So the quest today in India continues to be unimpeded inter faith marriage because there are domestic laws that are being brought in by you know domestic constituencies and domestic um, um, political parties where they don't agree with marriages between Hindus and Muslims and they try to prosecute those uh, and we battle that as well so the quintessential idea that uh, a citizen in India should be able to marry who he or she wants to marry or who they want to marry uh, is a very simple and we believe constitutionally protected notion. The idea that you can eat what you want, you can dress how you want, you can marry who you want, you can expect self-determination and autonomy uh, and dignity and equality. These are very, very quintessential constitutional values that we would like to trigger uh, with marriage. Great. I mean, it makes a lot of sense uh, the way you put it so succinctly, you know. Um, the thing is, you know, you, you spoke about us all in the region having, you know, similar, you know, uh, laws and stuff like that. Um, obviously, you know, we've, we've uh, got these from uh, old British colonial laws. Um, you guys have managed to somehow, um, you know, get rid of that uh, sodomy law. Um, here in Sri Lanka, slightly different, of course, we have uh, uh, both laws that, um, you know, uh, criminalize uh, same-sex sexual relationships and women have also been included in that. So it's slightly different yes. From, yes. from India. So what implications does the repeal of Section 377 have for other countries in Asia, particularly those that share British colonial era penal codes, such as my country, Sri Lanka? Yeah. No, I think um, that's a very good question. You know, and I say this, uh, you know, with all humility, right? Because, um, uh, you know, obviously, I don't believe that jurisprudence is a one-way conversation. It's not that it flows from India to the rest of mm -hmm. South Asia. Uh, you know, I'm not advocating that. So I say this with an enormous amount of humility, you know, and I have great respect and regard for the courts uh, of Sri Lanka. I have many friends who litigate um, uh, in your courts. Um, um, and it is this, right? The reality is in all our countries, and this is, you know, outside of South Asia also, we have been left behind these sodomy laws and these laws uh, that prescribe same-sex relationships, which were not part of our original cultures. We have mm -hmm. been left behind these laws yeah. by colonizers who sought to regulate and control our conduct in every which way, whether that's trade, whether that's assets, whether that's natural resources, whether that was our bodies, and including, um, you know, how we love, right? Um, for independent countries that have fought so hard for their independence, whether it's India, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, uh, across the region, right? And Malaysia, I mean, you know, there is, there's a long line of post-colonial countries who have received, and that's exactly what it is, who have received sodomy laws uh, from the British colonizer. Um, it is it is not wise or just for our governments to keep colonial laws in place. Decolonization must mean more than just formal independence. It must mean law reform. It must mean a repudiation of what the colonizer has left, including laws like this, including legal values like this. Um, so I think that's the first thing. So 377... Uh, India becomes the first colonial uh, jurisdiction to bring in a codified penal code. So 377 uh, of the Indian Penal Code 1862 is in fact the first, the, the kind of the test tube. So the British use it first in India. They use this idea of a codified penal law and then from India move it to other jurisdictions. 
Um, that is the flow of it. The irony of independent, modern, post-colonial governments to use uh, their might to keep these laws in place begs the question, whose laws are they? Why do we feel compelled to retain them when these were never our values? Right? So I think that's the first thing, right? that we have to recognize the colonial origins of these laws, even though they may have then subsequently been upheld uh, in free countries. But nonetheless, the origins of the laws are very important because it is a very important part of decolonization, that we reclaim who we are. Right? That is the quest of all post-colonial movements. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is this, that you know these are global constitutional conversations that courts have. The Supreme Court of Sri Lanka has with India, with India's Supreme Court, that India's Supreme Court has with Bangladesh, it has with Pakistan, it has with Nepal. Uh, Nepal is another country in the region that has not only decriminalized, but Nepal actually spoke of gay rights before, before even India did. Mm -hmm. uh, so Nepal Supreme Court is very much part of this. Um, and obviously, other great courts of the global south, uh, South Africa, uh, is one such court. Um, so I think part of this is that this is not about following, but that this is about, you know, being part of those conversations between different constitutional courts as to how do you expand freedom. Right. And this is something that I believe, and I'm quite idealistic about this, I believe that all judges are invested in expanding freedom. Right. So to, you know, the very distinguished, and, and Sri Lanka has a very distinguished bar and a very distinguished judiciary. It's a very old, distinguished bar that you have. So to those judges and senior colleagues at the bar, um, you are also, I believe, interested and invested in expanding freedom, in being part of these constitutional conversations as how do you expand human dignity in our countries. And sometimes we will have ruling governments that are also interested in that conversation and sometimes we will have governments who are not. But as constitutional courts, as senior members of the bar, we are committed to understanding what we don't know. If we don't understand gay lives, uh, queer love, then we must be open-minded to have that understanding come to us because that is quintessentially what judges do. They try to understand who is before them so they can arrive at judicial decisions that their own life experiences may not necessarily help them arrive at, but, but legal training will, that mm -hmm. constitutional values will that the courtrooms that they preside over and the storytelling that happens in their courtrooms open their minds. It is one of the most beautiful um, things about being a judge, that you can actually change your opinion and move with times because those stories are told in your courtroom. It is not a static job. Who comes to court changes from day to day. Those stories that are told to you change. And this is the most beautiful part about being a judge you can elevate yourself as a human being by opening your mind. And that is the most profoundly wonderful thing about being a judge. So I say this to judges, not just you know in India, but I say this to judges in all of South Asia. You are, you know, you are actually gifted with this wonderful job, which enables you to experience other people's lives. So let us all go on this journey together. Great. You know, in Sri Lanka, we have an added twist uh, in the tale because um, in 1978, when they had constitutional amendments, they brought in a savings law clause. So it uh, basically prevents us yeah. from, you know, filing a case uh, in the Supreme Court or even in, in any uh, uh, court in Sri Lanka. So, of course, we have to try and find a way around this. One way is constitutional reform, which for the second time in the last five years, we're going through again. Yes. Let's hope something, you know, tangible happens. But uh, we cannot just rely on the courts to push for further reform on LGBTIQ yes. issues, right? Sure. What must parliamentarians, for example, do to carry the torch? And what issues should they be focusing on? Sure. You know, I think that um, this is a very key part of it, these conversations that we have with parliamentary colleagues, right? I mean, I think this is a very, very key part because after all, there are they are the people's representatives. And these are conversations that certainly 
um, uh, in India we keep trying to have, you know, and I'll be consulted by members of parliament on, on X issue and I will also bring this up, um, you know. So I think that uh, we have had, unfortunately, very little luck Muran, with the um, change that has come from parliament. Um, when Section 377 still applied to queer people in India, there was a move uh, by specific members of parliament to introduce private members bills to, uh, in fact, ensure that Section 377 did not apply uh, to consensual same-sex relationships. And um, those bills didn't even muster basic support um, in parliament. Um, you know, what's, what's very interesting about gay rights and queer rights of, of, of kinds is that the courts have really been the bastions that have brought in change mm -hmm. um, all over the world. Um, I think in, in some larger countries where state legislatures have been very predominant, uh, then there has been um, um, sort of efforts uh, to kind of uh, work with members of parliament. And I think for members of parliament, I think this is what's really crucial, right? Um, I think you have to keep engaging them. This is a long quest and you have to keep engaging them. But I think it's also critically important, you know, there are two parts to this, right? It's also critically important for gay people, queer people to consider careers in politics. Uh, you know, and that, you know, I know that that is an ideal and that is a difficult one. But I think part of how we make change is to participate in institutions. Uh, these are difficult battles. Uh, when I first started, you know, practicing law, uh, I did not know a single openly gay person, not one, you know, uh, and this was 22 years ago. Hmm. Uh, the practice of law as a, you know, anywhere in the world is, is uh, the law is a very conservative institution. Uh, it's conservative for women, it's conservative for religious minorities, for lower castes, uh, and certainly for gay people. Um, I think you have to believe that, you know, you can be part of the conversation. So whether that includes, you know, getting involved in local politics at the level of your immediate community, your immediate neighborhood, uh, and then taking that further, I think that is a very, very important step for gay people to wade into. Um, you you cannot only participate in politics which concern queer rights. You have to participate in politics which implicate other issues also and build right. coalitions. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing I learned from Nepal. When Nepal's um, initial you know, draft constitution was being put together, uh, activists like Sunil Babu Pant, who were part of the Constituent Assembly, did this very well. You know, he built coalitions. So firstly, he was in parliament, so he participated in politics as a queer rights activist. But he also built coalitions uh, with other members um, from other, you know, parliamentarians from other disadvantaged groups, whether that's uh, those, you know, who spoke for uh, folks who are physically challenged, uh, environmental groups, women's groups. So I think that is part of it. How do you build these coalitions? If you want to affect change politically, that will eventually precipitate into parliamentary change, then you have to participate in larger politics around you, uh, including formally in politics, but also building coalitions with other groups. And I think that is something as gay people we have, we must do, we absolutely must do. Because when we step up for other groups that are disadvantaged, then you can in turn hope that they will step up for you. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that that is, that is a very critical part of, the, of that conversation. So whether it's participating in your immediate neighborhood uh, or as in India that we have municipalities, uh, we have states, you know, we have larger regions and we have the union government, the federal government. I think that participation across um, the hierarchies must be done. And participation must also happen along political issues that may not implicate us directly but do implicate us as constitutional values are weakened. Uh, uh, because, you know, this is the thing, my freedom or your freedom doesn't exist in a silo. You know, it exists in tandem with other freedoms that are protected for other groups. Uh, and, you know, I say this always that, you know, India is a country where a majority of people are minorities, whether those are religious minorities, sexual minorities, women, caste minorities, we are actually, all of us, all our societies are actually communities of minorities. But the question is, are we able to speak to each other? Because the dominant 
majority you know of in india and that is of you know upper caste men is actually the smallest minority in the country numerically but they wield enormous power so the question is how do you get there right yeah it's 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 a uphill journey sometimes yeah, and i think uh, we really need to start at some point isn't it um yeah. like you guys have started um of course you know things are quite quite different here in sri lanka Absolutely. so uh, I, you know it's uh, it's a much more difficult journey than uh, yes. you know I, I sometimes wish that we didn't have that savings law clause i would have put a case a long time yeah. ago and i would have called you to come and uh, do it for me <laughs> but uh, i uh, know that we're running out of time at the moment uh, nenaka it has been an absolute pleasure Uh, you know, um, talking with you today. Um, you're always an eye opener, my dear. You're so you know passionate, and you know your stuff so well. And it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's uh, thank you for lending your time to the Global Equality Caucus and for your legal advocacy on behalf of the people of India. Thank you, as my friend. for being thank there you. and being the person that you are thanks so much thank you so much it's wonderful to see you thank you for making the time uh, to have this conversation um and you know i just want to say that we are inspired um by your battles you know and i know it's thank a very you. difficult and hard journey and we have been constantly inspired uh by the work that you do um and uh, we would just like you to know that you know we are here you know and and we are part of this process and this journey together so be well be thank safe thank you uh and i look forward to seeing you in person in better times absolutely and thank you your words mean so much thanks a Take lot menaka you too care. take care be well yeah